God says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. The problem is, well, actually, there's many problems with what God tells Abraham to do in this story. But the first problem is that Isaac is not his only son. The book of Genesis tells us that when Abraham was 85 years old, his slave Hagar bore him a son named Ishmael. 14 years later, his wife Sarah bore him a son named Isaac. When Isaac was weaned, according to the scripture, a party was thrown to celebrate that the birthright would pass to Isaac. At the party, Sarah became concerned that the older son, Ishmael, would make a claim to inherit as he was the firstborn. And so she asked Abraham to exile Ishmael. Now there are reasons why Isaac was the son to inherit and not Ishmael, not the least of which is that Isaac was the firstborn son of the wife and Ishmael was the firstborn son of the slave. But two sons indeed had father Abraham. The text tells us that Abraham was distressed by this request. Of course, Abraham was distressed by this request. But God assures him that Ishmael will be the father of many nations, just as Isaac will be the father of many nations. God's favor, God's covenant will follow Isaac's descendants, but Ishmael will also prosper. Then when we read on, we get to this heart-wrenching scene. Abraham gives Hagar a skin of water and some bread in the morning and tells her to take her son and go. No preparation, no directions, no plan. Just go out into the desert. They go until they have no more water. Then Hagar puts a dehydrated Ishmael in the shade of a tree and turns her back to cry and pray because she does not want to look upon the death of her child. And she has no more water to give. Fortunately, God steps in and creates this well and they survive. But Abraham does not know that part of the story, all that he knows is that he sent Ishmael into the desert with nothing but a skin of water and some bread. Now we don't get to know how long passes between sending Ishmael to the desert and God calling Isaac your only son. Some things have happened, a new well is dug and a treaty agreed upon with Abimelech whose armies swore fealty to Abraham. And then the text says, God tests Abraham. So Isaac is at least past weaning, but the next story we get in the sequence of Genesis is Sarah's death some 30 years later, so he could have been as much as 30 years old. The story reads a lot differently if we're talking about a five-year-old than a 30-year-old, right? But we don't get to know which it is. The text does not say that Abraham was distressed. God says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering. And the text does not say Abraham was distressed. Is it because we already know he would be, given his distress with Ishmael? Is it because enough time has passed and he's heard how Ishmael is prospering and therefore his blind faith in God is justified? I don't think I would have wanted to be one of Abraham's sons. All of the common methods of academic interpretation will tell you that the meaning of this text is about having faith in God, about putting your faith in God above all things, including the love of your children. I learned this week that the big Muslim celebration that was going on was Eid al-Adha, or the celebration of the sacrifice of Ishmael. In Islam, obedience to God is very important, perhaps the most important. In the Quran, Ibrahim, Abraham, has a dream in which Allah commands him to sacrifice his son Ishmael, a sign of obedience. In the writing, 
Shaitan, or Satan, attempts to confuse Ibrahim and tempt him not to go through with the act, but Ibrahim drives him away. Celebrations of this story throughout the Muslim world include the sacrifice of an animal, visits with friends and family, and gifts to charities. Now, as progressive Christians, people of faith who also take social science and trauma-informed ministry seriously, we have to deal not just with the blind faith meaning of this story, but the form that the teaching takes. If God allows Abraham to send Ishmael out to the desert where he could easily die of thirst and requires Abraham to be willing to sacrifice the son he loves, is this a God we can trust? Are God's actions ones we want to emulate even symbolically? Does it make a difference that both sons survive and by all worldly accounts prosper? God says, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. I wonder, would we do this? I can tell you that it doesn't pass the test I learned in seminary to discern between the voice of God and psychosis. The first question in the text is, does this come in the interest of your health and wholeness and the health and wholeness of the world? Or does it tell you to hurt yourself and others? We decided in our sermon study on Monday that it doesn't pass the second requirement of the test, which is to share the insight with your community of care and get their feedback. We wondered what Sarah would have said to, oh, by the way, God told me to take our son, our only son whom we love, up the mountain and sacrifice him. Surely Sarah would not have allowed this, even if she is the one that commanded Ishmael to be sent away. Abraham's response to God was not about discerning the accuracy of the prophecy. His response was obedience, a faithful obedience that is to be an example for all followers of Abrahamic traditions. Abraham responds, here I am. And this phrase is not just saying present when your name is called, it's a faith statement, meaning I am ready to do your will. Later, we'll sing, Here I Am, Lord. And I want you to think of it this way and see what happens to you as you sing, Here I am. I am ready to do your will. Does it make you nervous about what you're committing to? Does it make you feel blessed and anointed for a special purpose? I am ready to do your will. I will hold your people in my heart. The phrase, Here I Am, is also similar to God's name that was given to Moses at the burning bush, I am. It seems that Abraham is pledging his intentions and his identity to God's will in the world. And with such an intense faith statement, it's easier to understand his willingness to follow God's command, even as distasteful as it is to us. Later, Abraham makes the same pledge to his son, and Charlie emphasized it by stuttering on it and reading it twice. Thank you, Charlie. Here I am, my son. Showing that his commitment to his son is equal to his commitment to God. Seeing this in the text, after understanding what the phrase here I am actually meant in ancient Hebrew was a relief to me. Because my commitment to my child is not only equal to my commitment to God, it is through the relationship and the love with my child that I understand the depths of God's love for me. It is distasteful to me to think of a God who values my child less than my faith. I was relieved that the text showed Abraham valued Isaac as much as his faith in God. This brings us to Isaac's response. Isaac asks, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Heart-wrenching question, isn't it? Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? 
Lutheran minister Diane Roth is comforted by the fact that Isaac has a voice at all. She points out that Isaac asks a question and the answer turns out to be the key, the resolution, the salvation even. She suggests we look to the questions of our children in order to find salvation from the abuses of our generation. The questions of our children. This reminded me about the voices of children in the film The Letter that we screened here recently. The voice of the youth in the movie is Rahima Pandey, a 13-year-old from India whose nightmares about climate change inspired her to work for climate justice, including signing on to the UN complaint that accused five governments of violating the Convention on the Rights of Children by failing to protect children from the dangers of a warming world. Probably the most famous child asking questions right now would be Greta Thunberg. Her questions are about why adults aren't doing anything, taking action against climate change. More locally, we might listen to Autumn Peltier, an Anishinaabe teen who's been nominated three times for the International Children's Peace Prize. Her questions are about water rights or the questions of my own child that have to do with why they would want to adhere to social norms that are meant to train them for a future they don't believe in, a future that includes blind obedience to authority, binary thinking, and the possibility that the climate will no longer be able to sustain human life. Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? When recognized as a question with the potential to have the key to resolving the problems in this story. And the problems in this story are problems of blind obedience and a culture that viewed children as property and offering solutions for them. This question can inspire us to listen to the questions of our children and to act upon their answers as if they are our very salvation. If God were to ask us to take our children whom we love and sacrifice them, what question might they ask us that contains our salvation? Redeema Pandey asks for protection from climate change, which in her world looks like wildly destructive monsoons and floods from rising seawater. Greta Thunberg asks us to act in response to climate change, stopping the behaviors that are making it worse. Autumn Peltier asks us to ensure adequate clean water for indigenous people, which is one of the issues decided upon by the Supreme Court this past week. I also ask, to what are we sacrificing our children? What do we follow with blind faith? unexamined privilege or comfortable apathy that makes a future for our children uncertain. We inherit a faith story in which the covenant, the promise of prosperity flows through Isaac and not Ishmael, through Jacob and not Esau, through Joseph and not his brothers. As a follower of Jesus, who was always weaving back in those that had been written out, I propose that Isaac's life matters, and so does Ishmael's. That we are the people of Jacob and Joseph and David, but that Jesus also brought in the lost tribes through the Samaritans and the descendants of Esau and Ishmael, whose voices have been edited out. How do we write them back in? Whose questions contain our salvation? I think I have answers. But I was invited into a conversation this week with someone whose answers would be wildly different from mine. We disagreed on something that is fundamental to my life philosophy. But our explanations on how we got to our disagreeing places sounded identical. In the explanations, we agreed. I think it was the catchphrase, the rhetoric, the binary thinking that you are for me or against me that made us disagree. So instead of answers, 
I leave you with the questions. Whose voices do we need to hear? Whose questions contain our salvation? May those who have ears be able to hear. Amen.